poor thinking habit. Most people who are not poor working, most people work hard, but they don't think hard. The mind is like a factory, a mental factory, and whatever you think about all day long pours ingredients into this mental factory. Don't let anybody just dump anything they want to in your mental factory. You've got to live with it. Everything starts with So you must be wise and careful what you think about it. Because that starts it. Let me give you a good question to write down. Where are my dents? These are some of the things you want to make sure of. You might be able to be casual about some. Here's some things. Be casual. Words. No. Words. What a man reads pours massive ingredients into his mental factory, and the fabric of his life is built from those ingredients. Here's number one. It needs to be nourished. It needs to be fed. Humans also need words. Words nourish the mind. Words give life. Words create insight. There's more than one way to see. We see with our eyes, we call that sight. There's another way to see called insight. That's why we come, gather for a couple of days, attend the classes, go to the training, read the books, do all the stuff to develop more insight. Letting our mind be nourished, think, under, wonder, conceive ideas, project, perfect. Give structure, something for the future, whether it's better health, better career, better future. Next, the mind needs to be exercised. Exercised by debate. Exercised by reading both sides, then both sides of the major life issue, major political issue. Don't leave yourself out of the great debate. We need both sides. Human. That is good. We love it. We study illness. So you can't study the negative. Just study the You have to give voice to and mind to, time to both sides of you so that you can strengthen your side of the army. Person's personal philosophy. Got this down. Our personal philosophy does two things. One, helps us to see the dangers on one side so we can avoid or minimize those. Then our personal philosophy needs to be developed so we can see the opportunities on the other side so we can maximize. For the balance of your life, that's going to be the twin challenge. The battle of the mind is significant for us every day. Beware of the thief on the street. It's after you. Also beware of the In your mind that says you're aren't you? Well, you. And it'll work for you. Stuff that goes on in our mind. One of the best. Whatever you do, don't become a thief. As you engage in this debate, what to eat, what not. Where to go, where not. To say what not. And what to do, what not. Make sure that you strengthen the positive side of this argument with yourself. So that day by day you become healthier. Day by day you become stronger. Day by day you become wiser. Day by day you build a better shield and immunity. So feed the mind, exercise the mind, and build your library. And I've had mentors along. Telling you, keep my mind stimulated. Keep my interest clean. Help me to evaluate in the way what is good, what is okay, what is better, and what is prosperous. Part of personal development for the mind, you've got to sort through what you read, what you see, and what you hear. Decide which of all of that is valuable for you to try. This is where being a student, follower, you read one book on good health and it says, do what this book says, you'll live for it. You read the next book on health and nutrition that says, if you do what that first book says, you'll die. 
Don't be a follower. Read both books and get your all done. The best phrases for the day I got. Make sure what you finally do is the product of your own. You don't just follow, but you listen. Both sides of the argument. Listen to the contra. Try to master the points. Both sides are three sides. Whatever. Then you start charting your own. It doesn't make you doesn't say you'll make always the right decision on what course to take or what to do. You can refine as you make sure that what you do Inclusion Inclusion from what may say suffer be a value weight. Read whatever you hear whatever you like. Will what? Do you whatever it's a lot of effort. A lot of effort. A lot of effort. Jot this all worth. Whatever stimulates you. Whatever stimulates you. The one there. Whatever stimulates you to react or even to debate. Even if you hear something you say, well that's not right. See that's still valid. Means your mind is ready to take on something, whether it's agreeable or not agreeable. Just so you're alive and alert and awake, ready to process anything that comes your best. Tomorrow you walk. See You are a self-made man or woman. You are where you are and what you are because of the thoughts that you have allowed to preoccupy your mind. Whatever you've dwelled upon over the months and years you have become and you are right now today. The thoughts are the guidance mechanism of your life. They'll control your thoughts. And when you when you control your thoughts, your thoughts determine your feelings. And I'll tell you why. It's because it is the thought that creates the feeling. It's how you think about something that has happened in your life that triggers the emotion. The way you explain things to yourself largely determines your emotion, largely determines your thoughts, your reactions, the response largely determines the whole quality of your life. We become worried, we become fearful, we become concerned and anxious, or on the other hand, we become happy and inspired. Things happen and we react, we think, and we say, well, of course I'm upset. You'd be upset too if you had the same experiences. Life is a continuous reaction to outside stimuli to the average person. So, one may be happy or sad, or life has meaning or is meaningless by evidence of what happens to us from day to day. But if you don't want to be upset, you needn't be upset, you see. The incident happens, there's no use denying it. But as far as your experience is concerned, the incident is completely external. It's always on the outside. What happens in your mind happens as a result of your attitudes and your feelings and your habit patterns. Your thoughts are your reactions to the incident. Always. The incident did not make the thought. It is your mind, and you have been thinking and reacting in thought according to the level of your consciousness. Remember the last time you said, he makes me so mad. By that, just tease me off. And of course, this is not correct at all. No one ever makes you mad. No one ever gets you upset. As I say often, you were upset because you're upset about it. You're angry because you have an anger consciousness that is touched like a little red button that causes it to blow up within yourself. But the anger is already within. Someone says something about you that you don't like. Someone behaves towards you in a way that you find offensive. Somebody does something or says something to you that you feel hurt by. And out of you comes anger, hatred, bitterness, tension, fear, anxiety, stress. And immediately you say, the reason that comes out of me is because of how he said it or the way that she said that or because they did that. But the truth is, the reality is, that what comes out, what's inside. So you react in thinking to the level, to, according to the level of your attitudes, according to your consciousness. Some of us are completely unaware of the fact that we have the power to control the kind of thoughts that run rampant in our minds. To so realize that it is your mind. 
Therefore, you have to ask yourself the question from time to time. When you find yourself terribly upset or concerned or anxious or worried about something that's happened, take a look, good look in yourself and ask yourself this one question. Why do I allow people or experiences or things to determine how I'm going to think or feel or act? In the same way, you're susceptible to the programming of mass media that is designed especially to control and influence thought simply because we've allowed ourselves to react. We are led into a life that is not really our own at all. We don't live our lives. We live lives that are conditioned by outside stimuli. But that's because we refuse to accept the responsibility for our own thoughts. So the very first step in this process that we're calling the art of thinking is to know that no matter what happens in your world, no matter what happens out there, no matter what you read in the papers, no matter what is taking place around you or to you, you always have a choice. Your anger is your choice, and you can always choose to be to be happy, angry, depressed, miserable, sad, or you could choose to be fulfilled and do something positive in this moment. It's always up to you. You can choose to think positively or creatively. You can become the master instead of the slave. It's not easy to think happiness when you're unhappy, because your unhappiness is busy manufacturing more unhappy thoughts. We're busy manufacturing negative thoughts. We'll fill the negative state of consciousness and goes round and round. It's a vicious cycle. But as I say so often, you don't have to have anything to be happy about ever. You can be happy simply because you want to be happy. Abraham Lincoln once said, a man is about as happy as he makes up his mind to be. This is the key to the positive life. This is the key to positive thinking. To simply determining that you have control and you can think the kind of thoughts that you want to think and making the commitment at the beginning of the day and regularly through the day that you're not going to allow people or conditions or circumstances to decide how you're going to think or feel. That is, you always have a choice. You always have a choice. And this is a very important realization. You better not read the news for a while and you keep yourself in perfect peace and develop the capacity to control your own thoughts. Then you can read the news and listen to the news and see what's going on in the world, saying that the world has problems today. But not I have problems. The world has grown. Then suddenly you, you're in a state of consciousness where you can be a, a creative asset to the world, but at least you're not going to be destroyed by it. If you will give it a good try, it will completely change your life for the better. Now I'll try to outline the 30-day test I want you to make. Now keep in mind that you have nothing to lose by making this test and everything you could possibly want to go. First, it's understanding emotionally as well as intellectually, that we literally become what we think about, that we must control our thoughts if we're to control our lives. I want you to write on a card what it is you want more than anything else. Make sure it's a single goal and clearly defined. You needn't show it to anyone, but carry it with you so that you can look at it several times a day. Think about it in a cheerful, relaxed, positive way each morning when you get up and immediately you have something to work for. Something to get out of bed for, something to live for. Look at it every chance you get during the day and just before going to bed at night. As you look at it, remember that you must become what you think about. And since you're thinking about your goal, you realize that soon it will be yours. Stop thinking about what it is you fear. Each time a fearful or negative thought comes into your consciousness, replace it with a mental picture of your positive and worthwhile goal. There will come times when you will feel like giving up. It's easier for a human being to think negatively than positively. That's why only 5% is successful. You must begin now to place yourself in that group. Don't concern yourself too much with how you're going to achieve your goal. Leave that completely to a power greater than yourself. All you have to do is know where you're going. The answers will come to you of their own accord. For 30 days. Do your best. If you should fail during your first 30 days, by that I mean suddenly find yourself overwhelmed by negative thoughts, you've got to start over again from that point and go 30 more days. Gradually your new habit will form until you find yourself one of that wonderful minority to whom virtually nothing is impossible. Don't forget the card. It's vitally important as you begin this new way of living in your spare time during your test period, read books that will help you. Inspirational books like Dorothea Brand's Wake Up and Live. 
The Magic of Believing by Claude Bristol, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill and other books that instruct and inspire. Nothing great was ever accomplished without inspiration. Above all, don't worry. Worry brings fear, and fear is crippling. The only thing that can cause you to worry during your test is trying to do it all yourself. Know that all you have to do is hold your goal before you. Everything else will take care of itself. Remember also to keep calm and cheerful. Don't let petty things annoy you or get you off course. Remember that you must reap that which you sow. You sow negative thoughts, your life will be filled with negative things. If you sow positive thoughts, your life will be cheerful, successful, and positive. Live this new way. The floodgates of abundance will open and pour over you more riches than you may have dreamed exist. Money? Yes, lots of it. But what's more important? You will have peace. You'll be in that wonderful minority who lead calm, fearful, successful life. Successful. The 80 20 rule is one of the most helpful of all concepts of time and life management. And this rule says that 20% of your activities will account for 80% of your results. 20% of your customers will account for 80% of your sales. 20% of your products or services will account for 80% of your profits. 20% of your tasks will account for 80% of the value of what you do and so on. Each of these tasks may take the same amount of time to accomplish but one or two of these tasks will contribute five or ten times the value of any of the others. Often, one item on a list of ten tasks that you have to do can be worth more than all the other nine items put together. This task is invariably the fraud that you should eat first. The sad fact is that most people procrastinate on the top ten or twenty percent of items that are the most valuable and important, the vital few. They busy themselves instead with the least important 80%, the trivial many that contribute very little to results. You often see people who appear to be busy all day long, but seem to accomplish very little. This is almost always because they're working on tasks that are of low value, while they procrastinate on the one or two activities that could make a real difference to their companies and to their careers. The most valuable tasks you can do each day are often the hardest and most complex. But the payoff and rewards for completing these tasks efficiently can be tremendous. You must adamantly refuse to work on tasks in the bottom 80% while you still have tasks in the top 20% left to be done. Before you begin work, always ask yourself, is this task in the top 20% of my activities or in the bottom 80%? There's a rule for success. Resist the temptation to clear up small things first. Remember, whatever you choose to do over and over again eventually becomes a habit that's hard to break. The hardest part of any important task is getting started on it in the first place. Once you actually begin work on a valuable task, you seem to be naturally motivated to continue. The fact is that the, the amount of time required to complete an important job is often the same as the time required to do an unimportant job. The difference is that you get a tremendous feeling of pride and satisfaction from the completion of something of valuable and significant. Time management is really life management. Your ability to choose between the important and the unimportant is the key determinant of your success in life and work. Make a list of all the key goals, activities, projects, and responsibilities in your life today. Resolve today that you are going to spend a more and more of your time working in those few areas that it can really make a difference in your life and career and less and less time on lower value activities. Maybe most people give up before they even make the first try and the reason they give up is because of all the obstacles, difficulties, problems and roadblocks that immediately appear as soon as you decide to do something that you've never done before. The fact is that successful people fail far more often than unsuccessful people. 
successful people try more things, fall down, you know, pick themselves up and try again over and over again before they win through. You should expect to fail and fall short many times before you achieve your goals. You should look upon failure and temporary defeat as a part of the price that you pay on your road to the success that you will inevitably achieve. Identify all the obstacles that stand between you and your goal. Write down every single thing that you can think of that might be blocking you or slowing you down from moving ahead in the area of problems and difficulties. Successful people think about solutions most of the time. Unsuccessful people think about problems and difficulties most of the time. Problem-oriented people talk continuously about their problems, about who or what caused them, how unhappy or angry they are, and how unfortunate it is that they have occurred. Solution-oriented people, on the other hand, simply ask the question, how, and then get to work to remove the problems. Personal leadership is the ability to solve problems. Effectiveness is the ability to solve problems. All men and women who accomplish anything of importance are people who have developed the ability to solve the problems that stand between them and their goals. The more you focus on solutions, the more and better solutions will come to you. The better you get at solving problems, the faster you'll be at solving each subsequent problem. Eventually, you will be solving problems that, that can have significant financial consequences for you and others. This is the way the world works. The fact is that you have the ability to solve any problem or overcome any obstacle on the path to your goal if you desire the goal intensely in accomplishing any major goal. There's always a constraint or bottleneck that you must get through. Your job is to identify it accurately and then to focus all of your energies on alleviating that key constraint. Your ability to remove this bottleneck or deal with this limiting factor can help you move ahead faster than perhaps any other step you can take. The 80-20 rule applies to the constraints between you and your goals. In this case, this rule says that 80% of your constraints will be within yourself. Only 20% of your constraints will be outside of yourself, contained in other people and situations. The primary obstacles between you and your goals are usually mental. They are psychological and emotional in character. They are within yourself rather than within the situation around you. And it is with these mental obstacles that you must begin if you want to achieve everything that is possible for you. The two major obstacles to success and achievement are fear and doubt. It is, first of all, the fears of failure, poverty, loss, embarrassment, or rejection that hold the average person back from trying in the first place. The second mental obstacle closely aligned to fear is that of self-doubt. We doubt our own abilities. We compare ourselves unfavorably to others and think that uh, others are somehow better, smarter, and more confident than we are. We think, I'm not good enough. And we feel inadequate and inferior to the challenges of achieving the great goals that we so much want to accomplish. The primary antidotes to doubt and fear are courage and confidence. The higher your level of courage and confidence, the lower will be your levels of fear and doubt and the less effect these negative emotions will have on your performance and behavior. The way that, the, that you develop courage and confidence is with knowledge and skill. The more you learn the things you need to know to achieve your goals, the less fear you will feel on the one hand, and the more courage and confidence you will feel on the other. Think about learning to drive for the first time. You are probably extremely tense and nervous and made a lot of mistakes. You may have driven erratically and been a danger to yourself, and others, but over time, as you mastered the knowledge and skills of driving, you became better and better, and your confidence increased. Today, you can quite comfortably get into your car and drive across the country with no fear or worry at all. You are so confident in driving that you can do it well without even thinking about it. Dr. Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania spent more than 25 years studying the phenomenon of what he called learned helplessness. The most common manifestation of learned helplessness is contained in the words, I can't. Whenever the victim of learned helplessness is offered an opportunity, possibility, or new goal, he immediately responds by saying, I can't. Whatever it is, he always has a self-limiting reason that immediately slams on the brakes of his potential. It short circuits any attempt or desire to set a new goal or to change things in any way. 
Learned helplessness is usually caused by destructive criticism in childhood, negative experiences growing up, and failure experiences as an adult. The way you get over this natural tendency to sell yourself short is by setting small goals, making plans, and working on them each day. As you become more confident in yourself and your abilities, you can set even larger goals. Eventually, with a record of successes behind you, it won't be long before you become unstoppable. The second mental obstacle that you need to overcome is the comfort zone. Many people become complacent with their current situations. They become so comfortable at a particular job or relationship or at a particular salary or level of responsibility that they become reluctant to make any changes at all, even for the better. Don't let this happen to you. The way that you get out of your comfort zone and break loose from learned helplessness is by setting big, challenging goals. You then break these goals down into specific tasks, set deadlines, and work on them every day. Once you've made a list of all the obstacles that are standing in the way of achieving your major goals, organize the obstacles by priority. What is the largest single obstacle? If you could wave a magic wand and remove one major obstacle from your path, which one obstacle, if removed, would help you the most in moving ahead more rapidly? When you ask the question with regard to your goal, why am I not there already? What answer comes to mind? What is holding you back? What is standing in? It is at this point Ed, that you have to drill down to determine the correct obstacle. Before you begin taking steps to remove it, you do this by asking the question, what else could be the problem? After each definition of the problem, by identifying the constraints or reasons that you are not achieving your personal income goals, each definition leads to a different set of solutions. They require that you think in different ways. In your personal life, it's the same. The accuracy with which you identify the obstacles or bottlenecks that are holding you back will determine the appropriateness of the various steps that you can take to remove or alleviate those obstacles. You could start off by stating the problem in this way. I am not earning enough money. So, what else is the problem? Maybe the answer is, I'm not contributing enough value to be worth more money. What else could be the problem? Maybe it's, I'm not uh, good enough at what I do to be capable of getting results that are worth more than I'm earning today. What else could be the problem? Well, you could say, I don't use my time efficiently enough during the workday. What else could be the problem? You could say, I spend my evenings watching television, my weekends socializing, and I seldom read or learn anything that would help me to be better at my job. Aha! Uh -huh. Now you have found the real problem. Now you have a clear idea of what you have to do differently. If you're going to solve your original problem, which was to earn more money, once you've determined the major obstacle that is holding you back, rewrite that obstacle as a positive goal. You then make a list of all the things that you could do to upgrade your knowledge and skills, improve your time management, increase your efficiency and effectiveness, and make more sales for your company. You set deadlines and measures next to each step in your strategy to achieve excellence in your field. You then select one key task and take action on it immediately. From then on, you hold your own feet to the fire. You discipline and drive yourself to do the things that you need to do to become the kind of person you need to become in order to achieve the goals that you've set for yourself. By following through on your resolution, you virtually guarantee your ultimate success and the achievement of almost any goal you can set for yourself. If you have any questions or concerns about the accuracy of your problem definition, discuss it with someone you know and trust. Put your ego aside, invite honest feedback and criticism. Be open to the possibility that you have fundamental flaws and weaknesses that are standing in the way of your realizing your full potential. Be brutally honest with yourself. Once your problem or obstacle is clear to you, ideas, opportunities, and answers will come to you from various sources. You will begin to attract into your life all kinds of resources that will help you to overcome the obstacle or difficulty either within yourself or, or within the situation around you and move you more rapidly towards your goal. For every problem or obstacle that is standing between you and what you want to accomplish, there is a solution of some kind somewhere. Your job is to be absolutely clear about what sets the speed at which you achieve your goal, and then to focus your time and attention on alleviating 
that constraint by removing your major obstacle. You will often make more progress in a few months than the average person might make in several years. Now here are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, identify a major goal of yours and then ask, why aren't I there already? What is holding me back? List everything you can think of. Second, identify the constraint or limiting factor in yourself or the situation that sets the speed at which you achieve your goal. And third, develop several definitions of your major problem or obstacle. Keep asking, what else is the problem? And be prepared to follow where the answer leads.